listening most of this, I promise. So please, go ahead. Thank you. Yep, hello everyone. Uh, today's presentation is going to be about the immune system uh, and how it has inspired a few uh, algorithms. <coughs> And this is going to be done by me, Andreas, uh, Benjamin, and Eric. So, first, just going to give a brief overview of the presentation. I'm going to start to talk about the biological system that, it's, that is in our bodies and everything. Uh, an intro, agents of the system, brief explanation of its functions. Then, we're going to continue with uh, uh, trying to extract the different fe uh, the, the important features of the immune system that can work in a computational system. Uh, then define what an artificial immune system actually is and uh, end with an uh, application, a concrete example of what it can be used for. So, the immune system, the defined uh, example was stated there, uh, it prevents death by infection. That's its job. It's the only job it does. It's quite significant. Though. Uh, and there are two basic types. Uh, that we have to distinguish between, and it's the innate and the adaptive. So the innate is, uh, there are tons of different substances entering our body all the time, and uh, the immune system will check each and every one, and you will first encounter the, uh, the innate immune system. Uh, and innate, um, and before I continue, I just need to put another word for these substances. They're called, uh, here we will call them pathogens that's defined as substance that could potentially cause a disease. Right, so this is the word I'm going to use. And the innate is directed against any pathogen entering the body. Uh, and uh, innate comes from the word inherited. So it's based on inherited traits uh, in the genes. So there is no so certain substances should just be removed immediately. Uh, but as you may understand, there are tons of substances that, or pathogens that the body has never ever encountered. And it still needs to get rid of it, or maybe not. And that's for the adaptive immune system to take care of. It can launch a specific attack against certain invaders. Uh, and that part will be what we're going to focus on in this presentation. Right? So, the two main agents in this are called T cells uh, and B cells. And they're white blood cells, as I think most of you have heard about. Uh, and there are many types of, let's start with the T cells, and there are plenty of those, plenty of different ones. Uh, to go over each and every one would be way too big, like way too much for this presentation, so we're just going to consider them as helpers. Okay? I get back to what it means. Uh, just for facts, they're made in the thymus, a little organ located above the heart. Uh, while the B cells are made in the bone marrow, so all over the body. Uh, and they produce the main part of, uh, which is the main factor of uh, an immune response, which is antibodies. Uh, that makes the uh, main strike against the pathogens entering the body. Um, so they can either neutralize them themselves, but more commonly they mark uh, the different pathogens so that killer cells of different sorts know what to kill and what not to kill. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief very simple view of how how it works when uh, a pathogen enters the body. Uh, but first, we need to make another very, very uh, nice biological definition. We are used to all math mathematical definitions, they're very straight. This is a typical biological definition. An antigen, molecule capable of inducing an immune response. And why I'm, why I'm talking about this one is that uh, the cells cannot react to the pathogens themselves, but these antigens that consist that are within the pathogens, okay? Uh, and those are exist in many different shapes and forms within each and every pathogen entering the body. Right. So when there is an antigen, antigen entering the body, uh, the T cell cannot react to it instantly. Uh, it doesn't know what it is. So there is something called an agent-presenting cell, an antigen-presenting cell, sorry, uh, that will take, pick it up, dissolve it into these little peptides, they're called, never mind the word, uh, but that makes it able for the T cell to recognize that, yeah, this is an antigen, this is something that we need to look over. When it has uh, found one of these, it will get activated and send out these like 
irritating substances of sorts to the B cell, activating the B cell. That will then uh, start to produce the antibodies I previously talked about. Uh, and uh, what it does this is become something called a plasma cell. And uh, it starts to just get rid of it, push out all these antibodies into the blood. And they will uh, either neutralize the antigen or pathogen or mark them so that other cells can come and you know, kill them. Right? This is basically it. But I mean, there are many questions here. Uh, why? How come the T cell is reacting to something it has never before seen? Like, and why? Why are they striking? Why are they making an attack against it as well? I mean, the bo our body are also making substances. Why? Why doesn't it just kill basically anything in the body all the time? These guys are not smart. They're just cells. They just have an input and an output. So, how does it know what to strike and what not to strike? So that's what I'm going to try to explain now. <coughs> So when a new uh, pathogen enters the body, it needs to learn how to recognize this particular pathogen uh, and target it. Um, and how does it do this? A procedure called positive selection. So when an antigen is uh, entering the body, uh, the agent presenting cell uh, dissolves the antigen. Uh, T cells and B cells will be attracted to this site. Uh, and the T cells and the B cells, they have receptors on their surfaces that can bind to only one particular antigen. And our body can produce around, I've heard different numbers, around a billion different combinations. So it's very likely that it will have some sort of cell that can react to a new antigen. And when it has finally uh, found a match, then the activation that I just mentioned on the picture uh, will happen but never before that. So just a, bit, uh, a T cell with a particular type of receptor will activate a B cell with the same type of re uh, receptor that will create antibodies of that particular sort of that B cell. Okay? This is known as the primary immune response. So when uh, antigen gets come in the body, this is time on this axis, antibody concentration in the blood. Antigen comes in, it starts to find a B and T cell that can react to this antigen. When that is done, uh, the B cells start to create antibodies, peaking the concentration level and killing off the, uh, the, the foreign pathogen. Right. But there is something else that happens <coughs> when the B cells uh, start to create antibodies. They also uh, clone themselves, making the thing more efficient. And some of these clones become memory cells that will not do anything at this time. They will just stay in the body. And they can stay in the body for decades, which is uh, exactly what when we vaccinate or get immune against certain sicknesses like measles and chickenpox, it's memory cells that stay in our body. And what happens then when the same pathogen uh, comes another time, the memory cells, uh, the whole positive selection procedure uh, doesn't have to occur. It will. Uh, the memory cells will react immediately, uh, creating, so there is like no lag period compared to before. And it will make a huge amount of antibodies killing the pathogen instantly, more or less. Worth mentioning is that, it, that the same procedure for another antigen, should another one come at the same time, can, ha can happen completely independently. So it doesn't have, there is no cue for it. It can happen parallel all the time. Yes, so that was the secondary response, the memory cells. So one more important question to answer is why the immune system never strikes substances that belong to our body, that the body needs, right? Uh, so it needs some sort of self recognition It needs to distinguish itself from foreign. And it does this uh, by something called negative selection. And that's based on our body is actually continuously producing something called self antigens, which is a substance that can react to the T cells, B cells, and antibodies just like a foreign antigen. However, should a T cell or B cell uh, have receptors that can react with a self antigen, there are mechanisms that will uh, delete these T and B cells from the system so that they can never get activated, never produce any antibodies, and never kill any, any of the substances that has these self antigens. Right. This is a little overview of what I've just mentioned, self-antigen to a cell, 
it gets deleted there as well. Uh, other cells, and if there is a foreign antigen that it gets reacted to, it will either become memory cells or plasma cells creating antibodies. Yep, so this was, I stress, a very, very simple view of what the immune system does and how it works. This is way more complex than this, and I missed many, many parts. Uh, but I think I've covered most important things, so now many of you take over and talk about how they make sense uh, in a computational system. Okay, um, so now Andreas has given you a brief overview of the biological immune system. I'm going to continue to explain why the immune system is a computational system and how we can draw inspiration from it to come up with uh, novel algorithms. So, even though it might not seem obvious at first, uh, by most formal definitions, the immune system is a computational system. And as such, it is able to perform many computationally complex tasks. Which is the reason why engineers and computer scientists have looked to this system for inspiration when trying to solve possible problems. So what are these abilities which we wish to mimic? Firstly, recognition and self-recognition. The immune system is a very strong classifier that is able to recognize and distinguish between a massive set of pathogens while still being able to recognize what is a part of itself. Secondly, feature extraction. Part of the process by which the immune system classifies these pathogens is by extracting features of the antigens, right? So essentially it creates a more efficient representation of the main information it's trying to store. Thirdly, diversity. Um, the immune system has to handle a large set of uh, different pathogens, right? And it, which is very diverse, and it does so by being very diverse itself. Learning and adaptivity. So as Andreas explained, um, the immune system is able to learn from past encounters and quickly adapt to new ones. Then memory. Um, the immune system is able to store a huge amount of information in a very robust and distributed fashion. And then last but not least, it does all of this through self-organization. So there's no central control. Um, all these pretty complex tasks are achieved only by local intera interactions of uh, relatively simple agents. So I'll now continue to explain a bit more in-depth how the immune system accomplishes all this, starting with recognition and self-recognition. So the immune system is able to classify pathogens by cells binding to antigens. It does so by matching molecule receptors to antigens. As one can imagine, the space of possible antigens as, and by extension the space of possible, possible molecule receptors is enormous. And um, the immune system basically creates new uh, molecule receptors through a, so they, they do it stochastically through a random search. So I could imagine it as a random search of this very vast space of uh, molecule receptors. So to avoid cells binding to uh, self antigens, they go through a negative selection process, which Andreas explained where they are presented with some antigens, and if they bind to them, they are eliminated from the system. Mimicking this procedure could be very useful in applications such as computer security. If you wish to be able to detect novel viruses instead of the usual approach of just matching um, a detected virus against a list of known viruses. Moving on to feature extraction, or the ability to extract important features from complex patterns. The immune system does this through the APCs, the antigen presenting cells, which extract and pre-process an antigen before presenting it to a T cell. This way, the immune cell only needs to recognize the pre-processed antigen, which in effect means it, needs, it can store less information um, than it else would need to. It doesn't need to recognize the actual antigen, just the pre-processed antigen. Extracting features is a very contemporary problem within data mining, um, and hence computer scientists are interested in understanding, interested in understanding this process. 
So diversity, or the ability to create and maintain meaningful diversity within a system. New system is able to respond to an ever-changing, a very diverse set of pathogens, right? So to do so, it needs to continuously create novel new cells to contract novel pathogens. The two processes by which it does this is gene recombination and somatic hypermutation. Gene recombination basically is just the random search which I previously mentioned. So um, basically, new receptor molecules can be created by combining existing ones, or the genes of existing ones. Um, the second process for creating diversity is somatic hypermutation. When a immune cell is primed to start cloning itself, it goes through somatic hypermutation. This means it mutates at a rate about five orders of magnitude larger than the normal rate of mutation. This can then instead be seen as a more directed and local search close to the structure of the uh, cell which has been stimulated. So this principle then leads us to our next ability, which is learning and adaptivity. So the diversity created by these two processes I just mentioned, gene combination and somatic augmentation, has to be regulated somehow. Otherwise, we would end up with the vast majority of our immune cells being mostly pointless because they don't bind to anything. This is assured by a very strong selective pressure where cells are more likely to survive if they bind well to their antigen. Um, this assures that the immune system continuously gets better at recognizing pathogens. All this means is that we basically have a continuously updated distributed system for classifying an ever-changing set of inputs, which has some obvious applications within machine learning if it can be mimicked. But for this to work well, we need to have uh, memory. A memory in the immune system uh, is created through these memory cells, right? That remember encounters with pathogens. These memory cells are created in this clonal selection process, which Andreas discussed. Uh, and their task is to mount the secondary immune response. Um, as a result of these immune cells, the system doesn't need to maintain a large amount of cells um, for each possible antigen. They can just store the correct immune cell design in one of these memory cells, basically. Instead of having to reinvent the correct response every time a pathogen reoccurs. And then last but not least, uh, self-organization. All these processes I've mentioned uh, are done in a distributed fashion, without any central control. So the detection of antigens is inherently distributed uh, throughout the system, each cell being stimulated independently and then spreading the information through the system. So the diversity, learning, and memory of the system are all emergent properties um, of a constant process of gene recombination, uh, mutation, and program cell death. This basically means that this very robust computational system is built from the ground up um, by simple interacting agents, um, essentially through a very fast and local evolutionary process. And this, in the end, is what makes the system so alluring to try to recreate in a uh, artificial math. So now Eric will uh, continue to talk about how scientists and engineers have drawn inspiration um, from this to the field of artificial immune systems. <coughs> yeah, so we have covered um, the biological aspects of the immune system um, and then Benjamin explained how to, to simplify things a little bit to, um, to be able to uh, use it for computational purposes. And uh, now, now I will talk about uh, artificial immune systems, or AIS, as they're called. Um, the newest definition is uh, artificial immune systems uh, are adaptive systems inspired by theoretical immunology and observed immune functions, uh, principles and models which are applied to problem solving. Um, quite a wide definition. Um, and now we will continue our way from biological um, part um, and trying to use it for problem solving. Um, 
it should really be noted that we don't want to, to replicate the entire human immune system all at once. Um, it's far too complicated and it's to no good use. We don't want to create an immune system for a human or a robot or something like that. Um, instead, what we try to do is to make use of ideas and mechanisms that could be used for uh, computational purposes and to, de to develop computational tools. Um, there are several areas where um, artificial immune systems can be used. Um, the most straightforward one is um, network security and virus protection, uh, which basically is negative and positive selection. Um, um, and there are also more far-fetched applications like optimization, and machine learning, and data mining. Um, a problem with the field of artificial immune systems is that it's very young, and it suffers a bit from its big diversity. Um, basically, any algorithm that um, makes use of some kind of property from the biological immune system can be called an AIS, and they're not connected to each other. Um, so we don't really know what we mean by an artificial immune system. So now we will describe an algorithm called multiple <coughs> immune inspired learning, um, which is uh, an algorithm uh, which is an attempt to create a framework for um, algorithms and that can be used as a complement to artificial neural networks and evolutionary algorithms. As I mentioned, the problem with immune system uh, inspired algorithms is that they are so diverse, so we need some kind of framework. And also, um, neural networks and evolutionary algorithms suffered a bit from this in the beginning, in the early years. But now, after some years, we all know what we mean by, by an artificial neural network or an evolutionary algorithm. So the goal is to um, take some kind of input data, like these three, cir three circles here, um, and preserve something like this in memory. Uh, the algorithm consists of three layers. Um, first, a free antibody layer, um, then a B-cell layer, and last but not least, a memory layer. Uh, as you will see, the algorithm contains a lot of simplifications, and for example, T-cells aren't a part the algorithm at all. Um, so the training data is visualized as antigens, what we want to fight. Um, so when presented the training data to the left, um, what will remain is that to the right, as I previously said. Um, in this free antibody layer, uh, here we have an antigen entering at this layer it gets presented to a certain fraction of these um, antibodies and not the entire system's ones. Uh, it's, it takes too much time. And then the antigen, uh, or antibodies are antigen specific, so they uh, react only to certain antigens. So if an antigen binds to any antibodies, it's, it takes it with it to the B-cell layer when it enters the B-cell layer, it gets random, randomly set, um, presented to all the B-cells until it can bind, uh, which is basically um, comparing to the previous figure with, uh, with the circles, if we are close enough to a point in the circle. So if the level of simulation exceeds a certain value, the B-cell will produce a clone of itself, which is mutated and preserved in the B-cell layer, uh, then starts to produce antibodies, and a clone is placed in the memory layer over there. Um, at first, the memory, the new memory cell is compared to all the other ones because we don't want to store too much information in the memory layer. So if there is already an existing one, which is better, or just uh, an exact copy of the new memory cell, it will just die, the new one. Um, also, if a B cell or an antibody isn't used for a certain period of time, it will die because it has no use to the immune system. Yeah, that's that algorithm. And now is just a summary left. 
Um, we started out with um, the biological immune system, uh, basically, basically, basically consisting of T cells, B cells, and memory cells. Um, and then we extracted some important aspects um, where the immune system was seen as a computational system, and then defined um, uh, artificial immune systems as some kind of algorithm making use of this. And last but not least, um, we have this multi-layer immune-inspired learning, which might be the future framework for these kind of this kind of algorithms. Thank you for listening. <laughs>